Introduction of Word Portraits of Famous Writers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Word Portraits of Famous Writers. Edited by Mabel E. Wharton. Introduction. The world has always been fond of personal details respecting men who have been celebrated. These were the words of Lord Beaconsfield, and with them he prefixed his description of the personal appearance of Isaac Disraeli. But we hardly need the dictum of our greatest statesman to convince ourselves that at all events every honest literature lover takes a very real interest in the individuality of those men whose names are perpetually on his lips. It is not enough for such a one merely to make himself familiar with their writings. It does not suffice for him that the essays of Elia, for instance, can be got by heart, but he feels that he must also be able to linger in the playground of Christ with the lame-footed boy, and in after years pace the temple gardens with the gentle-faced scholar, before he can properly be said to have made Lamb's thoughts his own. At the best, it is but a very incomplete notion that most of us possess as to the actual personality of even the most prominent of our British writers. The almost womanly beauty of Sidney, and the keen eyes and razor face of Pope, would perhaps be recognized as easily as the well-known form of Dr. Johnson. But taking them en masse, even a widely read man might be forgiven if from amongst the scraps of hearsay and curtly recorded impressions on which at rare intervals he might alight he cannot very readily conjure up the ghosts of the very men whose books he has studied and to whose haunts he has been an eager pilgrim such a power the following pages have attempted to supply they contain an account of the face figure dress voice and manner of our best-known writers ranging from geoffrey chaucer to mrs henry wood drawn in all cases when it is possible by their contemporaries and when through lack of material this endeavour has failed the task of portrait painting has devolved either on other writers who owed their inspiration to the offices of a mutual friend or on those whose literary ability and untiring research have qualified them for the task infinite toil has not always been rewarded and it would be easy to supply at least half a dozen names whose absence is to be regretted beaumont and fletcher are as much read as thomas otway and william watton has perhaps as much right of entrance as his famous opponent richard bentley but as a small child pointed out when the book was first proposed you can't find out what isn't there and the worth of the book naturally consists in keeping to the lines already indicated an asterisk placed under the given reference means that the writer of that particular portrait who is not necessarily the writer of that particular book did not actually see his subject but that he is describing a picture or else he is building up one from substantiated evidence sometimes as in the case of suckling this distinction leads to the same book supplying two portraits only one of which is at first hand when a date is placed at the foot of a description it refers to the appearance presented at that time and not to the period when the words were penned british writers only are named and amongst them there is of course no living author chaucer's birth date has been given as about thirteen forty for the traditional year of thirteen twenty eight is based on little more than the inscription on his tomb which was not placed there until the middle of the sixteenth century while according to his own deposition as witness his birth could not have taken place until about twelve years later in only one other instance has there been a departure from recognized precedent and that is in the case of thomas de quincey in defiance of almost every compiler and present-day writer i have entered the name in the cues and spelt it as here written the reason for this is threefold first he himself invariably spelt his name with a small d second hood woodsworth and lamb and i believe all his other contemporaries did the same third de quincey himself was so determined about the matter that he actually dropped the prefix altogether for some little time and was known as mr quincey his name i write with a small d in the day as he wrote it himself 
he would not have wished it indexed among the d's but the q's wrote the rev francis jaycox who was one of his last weighed friends and in spite of his recent and skilful biographers it must be conceded that after all the little man had the greatest right to his own name i am glad to take this opportunity of thanking those who have helped me and who will not let me speak my thanks direct it is a pleasant thought that while working amongst the literary men of the past i have received nothing but kindness from those of to-day first and foremost to mr george augustus sale to whom i am infinitely indebted also to mrs huntingford mrs and mr frederick chapman mr henry m trollope dr w f fitzpatrick and mr s c hall to all these as well as to my own personal friends i offer my hearty and sincere thanks m e w end of introduction Section 1 of Word Portraits of Famous Writers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo. Word Portraits of Famous Writers. Edited by Mabel E. Watton. Joseph Addison, 1672 to 1719 from temple bar 1874 asterisk of his personal appearance we have at least two portraits by good hands before us are three carefully engraved portraits of him but there is a great dissimilarity between the three except in the wig sir godfrey kneller painted one of these portraits which is entirely unlike the two others let us however give sir godfrey the credit of the best picture and judge addison's appearance from that the wig almost prevents our judging the shape of the head yet it seems very high behind the forehead is very lofty the sort of forehead which is called commanding by those people who do not know that some of the least decided men in the world have had high foreheads the eyebrows are delicately penciled yet show a vast deal of vigor and expression they are what his old latin friends who knew so well the power of expression in the eyebrow would have called supercilious and yet the nasal end of the supercilium is only slightly raised and it droops pleasantly at the temporal end so that there is nothing satanic or ill-natured about it the eyebrow of addison according to kneller seems to say you are a greater fool than you think yourself to be but i would die sooner than tell you so the eye which is generally supposed to convey so much expression but which very often does not is very much like the eyes of other amiable and talented people the nose is long as becomes an orthodox wig quite as long we should say as the nose of any member of peel's famous long nose ministry and quite as delicately chiselled the mouth is very tender and beautiful firm yet with a delicate curve upwards at each end of the upper lip suggestive of a good joke and a calm waiting to hear if any man is going to beat it below the mouth there follows of course the nearly inevitable double chin of the eighteenth century with a deep incision in the centre of the jawbone which shows through the flesh like a dimple on the whole a singularly handsome and pleasant face wanting the wonderful form which one sees in the faces of shakespeare prior congreve castlereagh byron or napoleon but still extremely fine of its own from johnson's lives of the poets of his habits or external matters nothing is so often mentioned is that timorous or sullen taciturnity which his friends called modesty by too mild a name steele mentions with great tenderness that remarkable bashfulness which is a cloak that hides and muffles merit and tells us that his abilities were covered only by modesty which doubles the beauties which are seen and gives credit and esteem 
to all that are concealed chesterfield affirms that addison was the most timorous and awkward man that he ever saw and addison speaking of his own deficiency in conversation used to say of himself that with respect to intellectual wealth he could draw bills for a thousand pounds though he had not a guinea in his pocket addison's conversation says pope had something in it more charming than i have found in any other man but this was only one familiar before strangers or perhaps a single stranger he preserved his dignity by a stiff silence End of section one section two of word portraits of famous writers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo. Word Portraits of Famous Writers. Edited by Mabel E. Watton. Harrison Ainsworth, 1805 to 1882. From S. C. Hall's Retrospect of a Long Life. I saw a little of him in later days, but when I saw him in 1826, not long after he married the daughter of ebers of new bond street and condescended for a brief time to be a publisher he was a remarkably handsome young man tall graceful in deportment and in all ways a pleasant person to look upon and talk to he was perhaps as thorough a gentleman as his native city of manchester ever sent forth from a personal friend Harrison Ainsworth was certainly a handsome man, but it was very much of the barber's block type of beauty, with wavy scented hair, smiling lips, and pink and white complexion. As a young man, he was gorgeous in the outre dress of the dandy of thirty-six, and, in common with those other famous dandies, de Orsay, young Benjamin Disraeli, and Tom Duncombe, wore multitudinous waistcoats over which dangled a long gold chain numberless rings and a black satin stock in old age he was very patriarchal looking his gray hair was swept up and back from a peculiar high broad forehead his mustache beard and whiskers were short straight and silky and the mouth was entirely hidden his eyes were large and oval and rather flat in form less expressive altogether than one would have expected in the head of so graphic a writer the eyebrows were somewhat overhanging and the nose was straight and flexible up to the day of his death he was always a well-dressed man but in a far more sober fashion than in his youth from ainsworth's rockwood what we have to add to what we have here ventured to record which the engraving which accompanies this memoir will not more happily embody this refers to a portrait by maclise which appeared in the mirror should that fail to do justice to his face to its regularity and delicacy of feature its manly glow of health and the cordial nature which lightens it up we must refer the dissatisfied beholder to Mr. Pickersgill's mastery full-length portrait exhibited last year, in which the author of The Miser's Daughter may be seen, not as some pale, worn, pining scholar, some fagging, half-exhausted, periodical romancer, but as an English gentleman of goodly stature and well-set limb, with a fine head on his shoulders and a heart to match. If to this we add a word, it must be to observe that though the temper of our popular author may be marked by impatience on some occasions it has never been upon any occasion marked by a want of generosity whether in conferring benefits or atoning for errors his friends regard him as a man with his few failings blended 
with fine qualities as most people and his enemies know nothing at all about him end of section two section three of word portraits of famous writers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kathleen word portraits of famous writers edited by mabel e wotton jane austen seventeen seventy five to eighteen seventeen heidler's jane austen and her works in person jane austen seems to have borne considerable resemblance to her two favorite heroines elizabeth bennett and emma woodhouse jane too was tall and slender a brunette with a rich color altogether the picture of health which emma woodhouse was said to be in minor points jane austen had a well-formed though somewhat small nose and mouth round as well as rosy cheeks bright hazel eyes and brown hair falling in natural curls about her face lee's memoir of jane austen as my memoir has now reached the period when i saw a great deal of my aunt and was old enough to understand something of her value i will here attempt a description of her person mind and habits in person she was very attractive her figure was rather tall and slender her step light and firm and her whole appearance expressive of health and animation in complexion she was a clear brunette with a rich colour she had full round cheeks with mouth and nose small and well formed bright hazel eyes and brown hair forming natural curls close round her face if not so regularly handsome as her sister yet her countenance had a peculiar charm of its own to the eyes of most beholders at the time of which i am now writing she never was seen either morning or evening without a cap i believe that she and her sister were generally thought to have taken to the garb of middle age earlier than their years or their looks required and that though remarkably neat in their dress as in all their ways they were scarcely sufficiently regardful of the fashionable or the becoming eighteen o nine austin sense and sensibility of personal attractions she possessed a considerable share her stature rather exceeded the middle height her carriage and deportment were quiet but graceful her features were separately good their assemblage produced an unrivalled expression of that cheerfulness sensibility and benevolence which were her real characteristics her complexion was of the finest texture it might with truth be said that her eloquent blood spoke through her modest cheek her voice was sweet she delivered herself with fluency and precision indeed she was formed for elegant and rational society excelling in conversation as much as in composition the affectation of candor is not uncommon but she had no affectation she never uttered either a hasty a silly or a severe expression in short her temper was as polished as her wit and no one could be often in her company without feeling a strong desire of obtaining her friendship and cherishing a desire of having obtained it end of section three section four of word portraits of famous writers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kathleen word portraits of famous writers edited by mabel e wotton francis lord bacon fifteen sixty one to sixteen twenty six montague's life of bacon he was of a middle stature and well proportioned his features were handsome and expressive and his countenance until it was injured by politics and worldly warfare singularly placid there is a portrait of him when he was only eighteen now exant on which the artist has recorded his despair of doing justice to his subject by the inscription c tabula dertur digna animum malum 
his portraits differ beyond what may be considered a fair allowance for the varying skill of the artist or the natural changes which time wrought upon his person but none of them contradict the description given by one who knew him well that he had a spacious forehead and piercing eye looking upward as a soul in sublime contemplation a countenance worthy of one who was to set free captive philosophy aubrey's lives of eminent persons he had a delicate lively hazel eye dr harvey told me it was like the eye of a viper campbell's lives of the lord chancellors all accounts represent him as a delightful companion adapting himself to company of every degree calling and humour not engrossing the conversation trying to get all to talk and turn on the subject they best understood and not disdaining to light his own candle at the lamp of any other little remains except to give some account of his person he was of a middling stature his limbs well formed though not robust his forehead high spacious and open his eye lively and penetrating there were deep lines of thinking in his face his smile was both intellectual and benevolent the marks of age were prematurely impressed upon him in advanced life his whole appearance was venerably pleasing so that a stranger was insensibly drawn to love before knowing how much reason there was to admire in him end of section four section five of word portraits of famous writers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by laura langston word portraits of famous writers edited by mabel e woten joanna bailey seventeen sixty two to eighteen fifty one from crab robinson's diary we met miss joanna bailey and accompanied her home she is small in figure and her gait is mean and shuffling but her manners are those of a well-bred woman she has none of the unpleasant airs too common to late literary ladies her conversation is sensible she possesses apparently considerable information is prompt without being forward and has a fixed judgment of her own without any disposition to force it on others wordsworth said of her with warmth if i had to present any one to a foreigner as a model of an english gentlewoman it would be joanna bailey eighteen twelve from s c hall's memories of great men of the party i can recall but one that one however is a memory joanna bailey I remember her as singularly impressive in look and manner, with the queenly air we associate with ideas of high birth and lofty rank. Her face was long, narrow, dark and solemn, and her speech deliberate and considerate, the very antipodes of chatter. Tall in person, and habited according to the mode of an olden time, her picture, as it is now present to me, is that of a very venerable dame, dressed in coif and kirtle, stepping out, as it were, from a frame in which she had been placed by the painter Van Dyck. 1825-1826 to 1826. From Sarah Coleridge's Letters I saw Mrs. Joanna Bailey before dinner. She wore a delicate lavender satin bonnet, and Mrs. J. said she is fond of dress, and knows what every one has on. Her taste is certainly exquisite in dress, though, strange to say, not, in my opinion, in poetry. I more than ever admired the harmony of expression and tint, the silver hair and silvery gray eye, the pale skin, and the look which speaks of a mind that has had much communing with high imagination, though such intercourse is only perceptible now by the absence of everything which that lofty spirit would not set his seal upon. 1834 End of section 5 Recording by Laura Langston Section 6 of Word Portraits of Famous Writers This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. Word Portraits of Famous Writers. Edited by Mabel E. Watton. Benjamin Lord Beaconsfield, 1804 to 1881. From Jefferson's Novels and Novelists. His ringlets of silken black hair, his flashing eyes, his effeminate and lisping voice, his dress coat of black velvet lined with white satin, his white kid gloves with his wrist surrounded by a long hanging fringe of black silk, and his ivory cane, of which the handle, inlaid with gold, was relieved by more black silk in the shape of a tassel. Such was the perfumed boy exquisite who forced his way into the salons of peeresses. 1829 from mills beaconsfield in the front seat of the conservative side of the house may be observed a man who if his hat be off which it generally is is sure to arrest one's attention and we need scarcely to be told after having once seen him that he is the leader of that great party he is not old just turned fifty we may suppose but he bears his age well whatever it may be his face which was once handsome is now sicklied over with the pale cast of thought the head is long and the forehead massive and finished the eye is restless but full of fire the hair black and curly nature has evidently taken some pains to finish the exterior about eighteen fifty five from j h duvivier portrait comparé des hommes d'état certes le premier aspect de m gladstone répond à l'idée qu'on peut se faire d'un chef doué d'un élan irrésistible mieux que l'attitude maladive de lord beaconsfield ses traits mous son regard flétri et comme perdu dans l'abstraction ou dans une rêverie hantée par la désillusion et la lassitude chez le plus faible on devine bientôt que si le fourreau est usé par la lame c'est à raison de la dévorante activité de celle-ci la tête s'incline avec mélancolie la bouche a pris l'habitude des contractions douloureuses mais que de patience invincible dans cette attitude quelle fécondité quelle soudaineté d'inspiration marquée sur ses lèvres que plisse le rictus de l'ironie section seven of word portraits of famous writers this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Shemp. Word Portraits of Famous Writers. Edited by Mabel E. Watton. Jeremy Bentham, 1748 to 1832. From Sir John Boring's Autobiographical Recollections. In the very center of the group of persons who originated the Westminster Review, stands the grand figure of jeremy bentham though closely resembling franklin his face expresses a profounder wisdom and a more marked benevolence than the bust of the american printer mingled with a serene contemplative cast there is something of playful humor in the countenance the high forehead is wrinkled but is without sternness and is contemplative but complacent the neatly combed long white hair hangs over the neck but moves at every breath simplex muditiis best describes his garments when he walks there is a restless activity in his gait as if his thoughts were let me walk fast for there is work to do and the walking is but to fit me the better for the work from sir john boring's life of bentham the striking resemblance between the persons of franklin and bentham has been often noticed of the two perhaps the expression of bentham's countenance was the more benign each remarkable for profound sagacity bentham was scarcely less so for a perpetual playfulness of manner and of expression few men were so sportive so amusing as bentham none ever tempered more delightfully his wisdom with his wit bentham's dress was peculiar out of doors he ordinarily wore a narrow-rimmed straw hat from under which his long white hair fell on his shoulders or was blown about by the winds he had a plain brown coat cut in the quaker style 
light brown casimir breeches over whose knees outside he usually exhibited a pair of white worsted stockings this shoes he almost invariably used and his hands were generally covered with merino lined leather gloves his neck was bare he never went out without his stick dapple for a companion he walked or rather trotted as if he were impatient for exercise but often stopped suddenly for purposes of conversation from crab robinson's diary december thirty first at half past one went by appointment to see jeremy bentham at his house in westminster square and walked with him for about half an hour in his garden when he dismissed me to take his breakfast and have the paper read to him i have but little to report concerning him he is a small man he stoops very much he is eighty-four and shuffles in his gait his hearing is not good yet excellent considering his age his eye is restless and there is a fidgety activity about him increased probably by the habit of having all round fly at his command eighteen thirty one End of section 7。section 8 of word portraits of famous writers。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org。recording by michael fascio。word portraits of famous writers。edited by mabel e watton。richard bentley。Sixteen sixty two to seventeen forty two. From R. C. Jebb's Bentley. The pose of the head is haughty, almost defiant. The eyes, which are large, prominent, and full of bold vivacity, have a light in them, as if Bentley were looking straight at the impostor whom he had detected, but who still amused him. The nose, strong and slightly tip tilted, is moulded, as if nature had wished to show what a nose can do for the combined expression of scorn and sagacity, and the general effect of the countenance, at a first glance, is one which suggests power, frank, self-assured, sarcastic, and, I fear we must add, insolent. Yet, standing a little longer before the picture, we become aware of an essential kindness in those eyes, of which the gaze is so direct and intrepid. We read in the whole face a certain keen veracity, and the sense grows, this was a man who could hit hard, but who would not strike a foul blow, and whose ruling instinct, whether always a sure guide or not, was to pierce through falsities to truth. End of section 8 Section 9 of Word Portraits of Famous Writers This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathleen. Word Portraits of Famous Writers. Edited by Mabel E. Wotton. James Boswell, 1740 to 1795. Littell's Living Age, 1870. The Sketch by Sir Thomas Lawrence of Boswell. Prefixed to Mr. Murray's edition of Johnson's Life illustrates with striking accuracy the saying of hazlitt that a man's life may be a lie to himself and others and yet a picture painted of him by a great artist would probably stamp his character the busy vanity the garrulous complacency of the man when out of sight of dr johnson as he may be supposed to have been when the portrait was etched are brought out with all the humour and point of a caricature without its exaggeration the thin nose that seems to sniff the air for information has the sharp shrewdness of a scotch accent the small eyes too much relieved by the high arched eyebrows twinkle with the exaltation of victories not won an expression contracted from a vigilant watching of dr johnson who when he spoke spoke always for victory the bleak lips making by their protrusion an angle almost the size of the nose proclaim boswell's love of drawing people out a thirst for information at once droll and impertinent but which finally embodied itself in a form that has been pronounced by lord macaulay the most interesting biography in the world the ample chins fold upon fold 
tell of a strong affection gross and almost sottish for port wine and tainted meats whilst the folded arms the slightly inclined posture the strong and arrogant setting of the head exhibit the self-importance the shrewd understanding not to be obscurated by vanity the imperturbable but artless egotism the clever inquisitiveness which have made him the best despised and best read writer in english literature the portraits handed down to us of boswell by his contemporaries are most graphic some of them are malignant some bitter some temperate and those that are temperate are probably just miss burney thus caricatures the appearance of boswell in johnson's presence when intent upon his note-taking the moment that voice burst forth the attention which it excited on mr boswell amounted almost to pain his eyes goggled with eagerness he leant his ear almost on the shoulder of the doctor and his mouth dropped down to catch every syllable that was uttered nay he seemed not only to dread losing a word but to be anxious not to miss a breathing as if hoping from it latently or mystically some information End of section 9section ten of word portraits of famous writers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by thomas peter word portraits of famous writers edited by mabel e walton charlotte bronte eighteen sixteen to 1855 from mrs gaskell's life of c bronte in 1831 she was a quiet thoughtful girl of nearly 15 years of age very small in figure stunted was the word she applied to herself but as her limbs and head were in just proportion to the slight fragile body no word in ever so slight a degree suggestive of deformity could properly be applied to her with soft thick brown hair and peculiar eyes of which i find it difficult to give a description as they appeared to me in her later life they were large and well shaped their colour a reddish brown but if the iris were closely examined it appeared to be composed of a great variety of tints the usual expression was of quiet listening intelligence but now and then on some just occasion for vivid interest or wholesome indignation a light would shine out as if some spiritual lamp had been kindled which glowed behind those expressive orbs i never saw the like in any other human creature as for the rest of her features they were plain large and ill-set but unless you began to catalogue them you were hardly aware of the fact for the eyes and power of the countenance overbalance every physical defect the crooked mouth and the large nose were forgotten and the whole face arrested the attention and presently attracted all those whom she herself would have cared to attract her hands and feet were the smallest i ever saw when one of the former was placed in mine it was like the soft touch of a bird in the middle of my palm the delicate long fingers had a peculiar fineness of sensation which was one reason why all her handiwork of whatever kind writing sewing knitting was so clear in its minuteness she was remarkably neat in her whole personal attire but she was dainty as to the fit of her shoes and gloves eighteen thirty one from harriet martineau's biographical sketches there was something inexpressibly affecting in the aspect of the frail little creature who had done such wonderful things and who was able to bear up with so bright an eye and so composed a countenance under not only such a weight of sorrow but such a prospect of solitude in her deep mourning dress neat as a quaker's with her beautiful hair smooth and brown her fine eyes and her sensible face indicating a habit of self-control she seemed a perfect household image 
irresistibly recalling Wordsworth's description of that domestic treasure. And she was this. 1850. From Bain's Two Great English Women. I can only say of this lady, Vida Dantum, I saw her first just as I rose out of an illness from which I never thought to recover. I remember the trembling little frame, the little hand, great honest eyes. An impetuous honesty seemed to me to characterize the woman. She gave me the impression of being a very pure and lofty and high-minded person. A great and holy reverence of right and truth seemed to be with her always. Such, in our brief interview, she appeared to me. 1851 End of Section 10section 11 of word portraits of famous writers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by adele pooley word portraits of famous writers edited by mabel e watton henry lord brougham 1778 to 1868 from tickner's life and letters brougham who i knew in society and from seeing him both at his chambers and at my lodgings is now about thirty-eight tall thin and rather awkward with a plain and not very expressive countenance and simple or even slovenly manners he is evidently nervous and a slight convulsive movement about the muscles of his lips gives him an unpleasant expression now and then. In short, all that is exterior in him, and all that goes to make up the first impression, is unfavourable. The first thing that removes this impression is the heartiness and goodwill he shows you, whose motive cannot be mistaken, for such kindness comes only from the heart. This is the first thing, but a stranger presently begins to remark his conversation. On common topics, nobody is more commonplace. He does not feel them, but if the subject excites him, there is an air of originality in his remarks, which, if it convinces you of nothing else, convinces you that you are talking with an extraordinary man. He does not like to join in a general conversation, but prefers to talk apart with only two or three persons and though with great interest and zeal, in an undertone. If, however, he does launch into it, all the little, trim, gay pleasure-boats must keep well out of the way of his great black collier, as Gibbon said of Fox. He listens carefully and fairly, and with a kindness which would be provoking, if it were not genuine, to all his adversary has to say. But when his time comes to answer, it is with that bare, bold, bullion talent which either crushes itself or its opponent. Yet I suspect the impression Brougham generally leaves is that of a good-natured friend. At least, that is the impression I have most frequently found, both in England and on the continent. 1819 From Newspaper Cutting, 1876 Standing in the narrow Gothic railed-off place reserved for the public, the throne at the opposite extremity of the house, you may see on one of the benches to the right almost every forenoon, Saturday and Sunday excepted, during the session, a very old man with a white head and attired in a simple frock and trousers of shepherd's plaid. It is a leonine head, and the white locks are bushy and profuse. So too the eyebrows, penthouses to eyes somewhat weak now, but that can flash fire yet upon occasion. The face is ploughed with wrinkles, as well yet it may be, for the old man will never see fourscore years again. And of these, three score, at the very least, have been spent in study and the hardest labour, mental and physical. The nose is a marvel, protuberant, rugose, aggressive, inquiring and defined, unlovely but intellectual. There is a trumpet mouth, a belligerent mouth, projecting and self-asserting, largish ears, and on chin or cheeks no vestige of hair. 
not a beautiful man, this, on any theory of beauty, Hogarthesque, Ruskinesque, Winkelmanesque, or otherwise. Rather a shaggy, gnarled, battered, weather-beaten, ugly, faithful, Scotch collie type. Not a soft, imploring, yielding face. Rather a tearing, mocking, pugnacious cast of countenance. The mouth is fashioned to the saying of harsh, hard, impertinent things. Not cruel, but downright, but never to whisper compliments or simper out platitudes. A nose, too, that can snuff the battle afar off. And with dilated nostrils, breathe forth a glory that is sometimes terrible. But not a nose for a pouncet fox, or a Covent Garden bouquet, or a flacon of frangipani. Would not care much for truffles either, I think or the delicate aroma of sparkling moselle, would prefer onions or strongly infused malt and hops, something honest and unsophisticated. Watch this old man narrowly, young visitor to the lords. Scan his furrowed visage. Mark his odd angular ways and gestures passing uncouth. Now he crouches, very dog-like, in his crimson bench. Clasps one shepherd's played leg in both his hands. Botherham, QC, is talking nonsense, I think. Now the legs are crossed and the hands thrown behind the head. Now he digs his elbows into the little Gothic writing table before him and buries his hands in that puissant white hair of his. The quiddities of Florum, QC, are beyond human patience. Then, with a wrench, a wriggle, a shake, a half turn, and a half start up, still very dog like, but of the Newfoundland, rather, now. He asks a lawyer or witness a question. Question very sharp and to the point, not often complimentary by times, and couched in that which is neither broad Scotch nor Northumbrian burr, but a rebellious mixture of the two. Mark him well. Eye him closely. You have not much time to lose. Alas, the giant is very old, though with frame yet unenfeebled with intellect yet gloriously unclouded. But the sands are running, ever running. Watch him, mark him, eye him, score him on your mind tablets. Then home, and in after years, it may be your lot to tell your children that once, at least, you have seen with your own eyes the famous Lord of Vaux. Once listened to the voice which has shaken thrones and made tyrants tremble, that has been a herald of deliverance to millions pining in slavery and captivity. A voice that has given utterance in man's most eloquent words to the noblest, wisest thoughts lent to this man of men by heaven. A voice that has been trumpet sounding these sixty years past in defence of truth and right and justice. In advocacy to the claims of learning and industry and of the liberties of the great English people, from whose ranks he rose, a voice that should be entitled to a hearing in a Valhalla of wise heroes, after Francis of Verulam and Isaac of Grantham. The voice of one who is worthily a lord, but who will be yet better remembered, and to all time, remembered enthusiastically and affectionately, as the champion of all good and wise, beautiful human things. Harry Brougham From Temple Bar 1868. The personal man, the bodily man, the private man, did not vary. From 1830 to 1866, the period between his brightest glow of fame and his mental eclipse, he was always the same gaunt, angular, raw-boned figure with the high cheekbones, the great flexible nose, the mobile mouth, the shock head of hair, and uncouthly cut coat with the velvet collar the high black stock, the bulging shirt front, the dangling bunch of seals at his fob, and the immortal pantaloons of checked tweed. It is said that one of his admirers in the Bradford Cloth Hall gave him a bale of plaid trousering, all wool, in 1825, and that he continued until the day of his death to have his nether garments cut from the inexhaustible store. I have seen Lord Brougham in evening dress and in the customary black continuations, but I never met him by daylight without the inevitable checks. End of section 11
Section 12 of Word Portraits by Famous Writers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eva Davis. Word Portraits of Famous Writers. Edited by Mabel E. Wooten. Elizabeth Barrett Browning, 1809-1861. From M. R. Mitford's Recollections of a Literary Life. My first acquaintance with Elizabeth Barrett commenced about fifteen years ago. She was certainly one of the most interesting persons that I had ever seen. Everybody who then saw her said the same, so that it is not merely the impression of my partiality or my enthusiasm. Of a slight, delicate figure, with a shower of dark curls falling on either side of a most expressive face, large, tender eyes, richly fringed with dark eyelashes, a smile like a sunbeam, and such a look of youthfulness that I had some difficulty in persuading a friend, in whose carriage we went together to Chiswick, that the translatress of the Prometheus of Aeschylus, the authoress of the Essay on Mind, was old enough to be introduced into company, in technical language, was out. 1835. From Sarah Coleridge's Letters. She is little hard-featured, with long dark ringlets, a pale face, and plaintive voice, something very impressive in her dark eyes and her brow. Her general aspect puts me in mind of Mignon, what Mignon might be in maturity and maternity. 1851. From Crabbe Robinson's Diary. Dined at home, and at eight, dressed to go to Kenyon. With him I found an interesting person I had never seen before, Mrs. Browning, late Miss Barrett. Not the invalid I expected. She has a handsome oval face, a fine eye, and altogether a pleasing person. She had no opportunity for display, and apparently no desire. Her husband has a very amiable expression. There is a singular sweetness about him. 1852 End of section 12。section 13 of word portraits of famous writers。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit librivox.org。recording by larry wilson。word portraits of famous writers。edited by mabel e wotton。John Bunyan, 1628-1688 From Charles Doe's Life of John Bunyan He appeared in countenance to be of stern and rough temper. He had a sharp, quick eye, accomplished with an excellent discerning of persons. As for his person, he was tall of stature, strong-boned, though not corpulent, somewhat of a ruddy face, with sparkling eyes, wearing his hair on the upper lip, after the old British fashion. His hair reddish, but in his later days time had sprinkled it with gray. His nose well set, but not declining or bending, and his mouth moderate large, his forehead something high, and his habit always plain and modest. From Tulloch's English Puritanism, Asterisk. It is impossible to look at his portrait and not recognize the lines of power by which it is everywhere marked. It has more of a sturdy soldier than anything else. The aspect of a man who would face dangers any day rather than shun them. And this corresponds exactly to his description by his oldest biographer and friend, Charles Doe. A more manly and robust appearance cannot well be conceived, his eyes only showing in their sparkling depth the fountains of sensibility concealed within the roughened exterior. Here, as before, we are reminded of his likeness to Luther. From Bunyan's Works, 1692 Give us leave to say his natural parts and abilities were not mean. His fancy and invention were very pregnant and fertile. The use he made of them was good, converting them to spiritual objects. His wit was sharp and quick, his memory tenacious, it being customary with him to commit his sermons to writing after he had preached them. His understanding was large and comprehensive, his judgments sound and deep in the fundamentals of the gospel, as his writings evidence. 
and yet this great saint was always in his own eyes the chiefest of sinners and the least of saints esteeming any where he did believe the truth of their grace better than himself there was indeed in him all the parts of an accomplished man his carriage was condescending affable and meek to all yet bold and courageous for christ's and the gospel's sake his countenance was grave and sedate and did so to the life discover the inward frame of his heart that it did strike something of awe into them that had nothing to fear of god his conversation was as becomes the gospel end of section thirteen section fourteen of word portraits of famous writers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. word portraits of famous writers edited by mabel e watton edmund burke seventeen thirty to seventeen ninety seven from Burney's diary and letters no expectation that i had formed of mr burke either from his works his speeches his character or his fame had anticipated to me such a man as i now met he appeared perhaps at the moment to the highest possible advantage in health vivacity and spirits removed from the impetuous aggravations of party contentions that at times by inflaming his passions seemed momentarily at least to disorder his character he was lulled into gentleness by the grateful sense of prosperity exhilarated but not intoxicated by sudden success and just rising after toiling years of failures disappointments fire and fury to place affluence and honours which were brightly smiling on the zenith of his powers he looked indeed as if he had no wish but to diffuse philanthropic pleasure and genial gaiety all around his figure is noble his air commanding his address graceful his voice clear penetrating sonorous and powerful his language copious eloquent and changefully impressive his manners are attractive his conversation is past all praise you may call me mad i know but if i wait till i see another mr burke for such another fit of ecstasy i may be long enough in my sober good senses seventeen eighty two from peter burke's life of burke asterisk the personal description of edmund burke has been handed down he was about five feet ten inches high well made and muscular of that firm and compact frame that denotes more strength than bulk his countenance had been in his youth handsome the expression of his face was less striking than might have been anticipated at least it was so until lit up by the animation of his conversation or the fire of his eloquence in dress he usually wore a brown suit and he was in his later days easily recognisable in the house of commons from his bob wig and spectacles from macknight's life of burke asterisk he deserved worship better than most idols gentle affectionate unassuming towards the members of his own family he was also dignified polished and courteous in his manner to all the rest of mankind nature had stamped the noblest impress of genius on his wrinkled brow and time had slowly conferred a grace on his address which made him appear singularly pleasing and lovable in the house of commons only the fiercer peculiarities of his character were now seen while at home he seemed the mildest and kindest as well as one of the best and greatest of human beings 
he poured forth the rich treasures of his mind with the most prodigal bounty at breakfast and dinner his gaiety wit and pleasantry enlivened the board and diffused cheerfulness and happiness all round End of section 14section fifteen of word portraits of famous writers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by nemo word portraits of famous writers edited by mabel e watton robert burns seventeen fifty nine to seventeen ninety six from curry's life of burns burns was nearly five feet ten inches in height and of a form that indicated agility as well as strength his well-raised forehead shaded with black curling hair indicated extensive capacity his eyes were large dark full of ardour and intelligence his face was well formed and his countenance uncommonly interesting and expressive his mode of dressing which was often slovenly and a certain fullness and bend in his shoulders characteristic of his original profession disguised in some degree the natural symmetry and elegance of his form the external appearance of burns was most strikingly indicative of the character of his mind on a first view his physiognomy had a certain air of coarseness mingled however with an expression of deep penetration and of calm thoughtfulness approaching to melancholy his dark and haughty countenance easily relaxed into a look of good will of pity or of tenderness and as the various emotions succeeded each other in his mind assumed with equal ease the expression of the broadest humour of the most extravagant mirth of the deepest melancholy or of the most sublime emotion the tones of his voice happily corresponded with the expression of his features and with the feelings of his mind when to these endowments are added a rapid and distinct apprehension a most powerful understanding and a happy command of language a strength as well as brilliancy of expression we shall be able to account for the extraordinary attractions of his conversation for the sorcery which in his social parties he seemed to exert on all around him from lockhart's life of scott his person was strong and robust his manners rustic not clownish a sort of dignified plainness and simplicity which received part of its effect perhaps from one's knowledge of his extraordinary talents his features are represented in mr nasmyth's picture but to me it conveys the idea that they are diminished as if seen in perspective i think his countenance was more massive than it looks in any of the portraits i would have taken the poet had i not known what he was for a very sagacious country farmer of the old scotch school i e none of your modern agriculturist who keep laborers for their drudgery but the douce gulma who held his own plough there was a strong expression of sense and shrewdness in all his lineaments the eye alone i think indicated the poetical character and temperament it was large and of a dark cast and glowed i say literally glowed when he spoke with feeling or interest I never saw such another eye in a human head, though I have seen the most distinguished men in my time. His conversation expressed perfect self-confidence, without the slightest presumption. Among the men who were the most learned of their time and country, he expressed himself with perfect firmness, but without the least intrusive forwardness, and when he differed in opinion, he did not hesitate to express it firmly, yet at the same time with modesty i do not remember any part of his conversation 
distinctly enough to be quoted nor did i ever see him again except in the street where he did not recognize me as i could not expect he should 1787 from dumfries journal 1796 his personal endowments were perfectly correspondent to the qualification of his mind his form was manly his action energy itself devoid in a great measure perhaps of those graces of that polish acquired only in the refinement of societies where in early life he could have no opportunities of mixing but where such was the irresistible power of attraction that encircled him though his appearance and manners were always peculiar he never failed to delight and to excel his figure seemed to bear testimony to his earlier destination and employments it seemed rather moulded by nature for the rough exercises of agriculture than the gentler cultivation of the belle lettre his features were stamped with a hardy character of independence and the firmness of conscious though not arrogant preeminence the animated expression of countenance were almost peculiar to himself the rapid lightnings of his eye were always the harbingers of some flash of genius whether they darted the fiery glances of insulted and indignant superiority or beamed with the impassioned sentiments of fervent and impetuous affections his voice alone could improve upon the magic of his eye sonorous replete with the finest modulations it alternately captivated the ear with the melody of poetic numbers the perspicuity of nervous reasoning or the ardent sallies of enthusiastic patriotism end of section fifteen section sixteen of word portraits of famous writers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by adele pooley word portraits of famous writers edited by mabel e watton samuel butler sixteen twelve to sixteen eighty from aubrey's lives of eminent men he is of a middle stature strong set high coloured a head of sorrel hair a severe and sound judgment a good fellow from aubrey's lives of eminent men he was of a leonine coloured hair sanguine choleric middle-sized strong a boon and witty companion especially among the company he knew well End of section 16section seventeen of word portraits of famous writers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by sonia word portraits of famous writers edited by mabel e wotton george lord byron seventeen eighty eight to eighteen twenty four from moore's life of byron among the impressions which this meeting left upon me what i chiefly remember to have remarked was the nobleness of his air his beauty the gentleness of his voice and manners and what was naturally not the least attraction his marked kindness to myself being in mourning for his mother the colour as well of his dress as of his glossy curling and picturesque hair gave more effect to the pure spiritual paleness of his features in the expression of which when he spoke there was a perpetual play of lively thought though melancholy was their habitual character when in repose eighteen eleven from george tickner's life i called on lord byron to-day with an introduction from mr gifford here again my anticipations were mistaken instead of being deformed as i had heard he is remarkably well built with the exception of his feet instead of having a thin and rather sharp and anxious face as he has in his pictures 
it is round open and smiling his eyes are light and not black his air easy and careless not forward and striking and i found his manners affable and gentle the tones of his voice low and conciliating his conversation gay pleasant and interesting in an uncommon degree eighteen fifteen from moore's life of byron it would be to little purpose to dwell upon the mere beauty of a countenance in which the expression of an extraordinary mind was so conspicuous what serenity was seated on the forehead adorned with the finest chestnut hair light curling and disposed with such art that the art was hidden in the imitation of most pleasing nature what varied expression in his eyes they were of the azure colour of the heavens from which they seemed to derive their origin his teeth in form in colour in transparency resembled pearls but his cheeks were too delicately tinged with the hue of the pale rose his neck which he was in the habit of keeping uncovered as much as the usages of society permitted seemed to have been formed in a mould and was very white his hands were as beautiful as if they had been the works of art his figure left nothing to be desired particularly by those who found rather a grace than a defect in a certain light and gentle undulation of the person when he entered a room and of which you hardly felt tempted to inquire the cause indeed it was hardly perceptible the clothes he wore were so long his face appeared tranquil like the ocean on a fine spring morning but like it in an instant became changed into the tempestuous and terrible if a passion a passion did i say a thought a word occurred to disturb his mind his eyes then lost all their sweetness and sparkled so that it became difficult to look on them eighteen nineteen end of section seventeen Section 18 of Word Portraits of Famous Writers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Pooley. Word Portraits of Famous Writers, edited by Mabel E. Watton. Thomas Campbell, 1777 to 1844. From Lee Hunt's Autobiography. They who knew Mr. Campbell only as the author of Gertrude of Wyoming and the Pleasures of Hope would not have suspected him to be a merry companion, overflowing with humour and anecdote, and anything but fastidious. When I first saw this eminent person, he gave me the idea of a French Virgil. Not that he was like a Frenchman, much less the French translator of Virgil. I found him as handsome as the Abbé de Lille is said to have been ugly. But he seemed to me to embody a Frenchman's ideal notion of the Latin poet. Something a little more cut and dry than I had looked for. Compact and elegant, critical and acute, with a consciousness of authorship upon him a taste over-anxious not to commit itself, and refining and diminishing nature as in a drawing-room mirror. This fancy was strengthened in the course of conversation by his expatiating on the greatness of Racine. I think he had a volume of the French poet in his hand. His skull was sharply cut and fine, with plenty, according to the phrenologists, both of the reflective and amative organs and his poetry will bear them out. For a lettered solitude, and a bridle properly got up, both according to law and luxury, commend us to the lovely Gertrude of Wyoming. His face and person were rather on a small scale, his features regular, his eyes lively and penetrating, and when he spoke, dimples played about his mouth, which, nevertheless, had something restrained and close in it. Some gentle Puritans seem to have crossed the breed, and to have left a stamp on his face, such as we often see in the female Scotch face, rather than in the male. But he appeared not at all grateful for this, and when his critiques and his Virgilianism were over, very unlike a Puritan he talked. 
he seemed to spite his restrictions, and, out of natural largeness of his sympathy with things high and low, to break at once out of Delille's Virgil into Cotton's, like a boy let loose from school. When I had the pleasure of hearing him afterwards, I forgot his Virgilianisms, and thought only of the delightful companion, the unaffected philanthropist, and the creator of a beauty worth all the heroines in Racine. About 1809. From Patmore's Sketch from Real Life The person of this exquisite writer and delightful man is small, delicately formed, and neatly put together, without being little or insignificant. His face has all the harmonious arrangement of features which marks his gentle and refined mind. It is oval, perfectly regular in its details, and lighted up not merely by eyes of youth, but by a bland smile of intellectual serenity that seems to pervade and penetrate all the features, and impart to them all a corresponding expression, such as the moonlight lends to a summer landscape. The moonlight, not the sunshine, for there is a mild and tender pathos blended with that expression, which bespeaks a soul that has been steeped in the depths of human woe, but has turned their waters, as only poets can, into fountains of beauty and of bliss. From Beattie's Life and Letters of Thomas Campbell He was generally careful as to dress, and had none of Dr. Johnson's indifference to fine linen. His wigs were always nicely adjusted, and scarcely distinguishable from natural hair. His appearance was interesting and handsome. Though rather below the middle size, he did not seem little, and his large dark eye and countenance bespoke great sensibility and acuteness. His thin, quavering lip and delicate nostril are highly expressive. When he spoke, as Lee Hunt has remarked, dimples played about his mouth, which, nevertheless, had something restrained and close in it. In personal neatness and fastidiousness, no less than in genius and taste, Campbell in his best days resembled Gray. Each was distinguished by the same careful finish in composition. The same classical predilections and lyrical fire, rarely but strikingly displayed. In ordinary life, they were both somewhat finical, yet with greater freedom and idiomatic plainness in their unreserved communications, Gray's being evinced in his letters, and Campbell's in conversation. End of section 18「Section 19 of Word Portraits of Famous Writers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo. Word Portraits of Famous Writers. Edited by Mabel E. Watton. Thomas Carlyle. 1795 to 1881. From Caroline Fox's Journals and Letters. Carlyle soon appeared and looked as if he felt a well dressed London crowd scarcely the arena for him to figure in as a popular lecturer. He is a tall, robust looking man. Rugged simplicity and indomitable strength are in his face, and such a glow of genius in it not always smouldering there, but flashing from his beautiful grey eyes, from the remoteness of their deep setting under the massive brow. His manner is very quiet, but he speaks like one tremendously convinced of what he utters. He began in a rather low nervous voice, with a broad Scotch accent, but it soon grew firm and shrank, not abashed from its great task. 1840 from Frude's Carlyle. He was then fifty-four years old, tall, about five feet eleven, thin, but at the same time upright, with no signs of the later stoop. His body was angular, his face beardless, such as it represented in Woolner's medallion, which is by far the best likeness of him in the days of his strength. His head was extremely long, 
with the chin thrust forward the neck was thin the mouth firmly closed the upper lip slightly projecting the hair grizzled and thick and bushy his eyes which grew lighter with age were then of a deep violet with fire burning at the bottom of them which flashed out at the least excitement the face was altogether most striking most impressive in every way and i did not admire him the less because he treated me i cannot say unkindly but shortly and sternly i saw then what i saw ever after that no one need look for conventional politeness from carlyle he would hear the exact truth from him and nothing else eighteen forty nine from wiley's carlyle the maid went forward and said something to carlyle and left the room he was sitting before a fire in an armchair propped up with pillows with his feet on a stool and looked much older than i had expected the lower part of his face was covered with a rather shaggy beard almost quite white his eyes were bright blue but looked filmy from age he had on a sort of colored nightcap a long gown reaching to his ankles and slippers on his feet a rest attached to the arm of his chair supported a book before him i could not quite see the name but i think it was channing's works leaning against the fireplace was a long clay pipe and there was a slight smell of tobacco in the room his hands were very thin and wasted he showed us how they shook and trembled unless he rested them on something and said they were failing him from weakness he seemed such a venerable old man and so worn and old-looking that i was very much affected our visit was on tuesday eighteenth of may eighteen eighty at about two p m end of section nineteen Section 20 of Word Portraits of Famous Writers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Fascio. Word Portraits of Famous Writers. Edited by Mabel E. Watton. Thomas Chatterton, 1752 to 1770. From Wilson's Chatterton. It is to be feared that no authentic portrait of Chatterton exists, and even the accounts furnished as to his appearance only partially aid us in realizing an idea of the manly, handsome boy, with his flashing, hawk-like eye, through which even the Bristol pewterer thought he could see his soul. His forehead, one fancies, must have been high, though hidden, perhaps, as in the supposed Gainsborough portrait, with long flowing hair. His mouth, like that of his father, was large but the brilliancy of his eyes seems to have diverted attention from every other feature, and they have been repeatedly noted for the way in which they appeared to kindle in sympathy with his earnest utterances. Mr. Edward Gardner, who only knew him during his last three months in Bristol, specially recalled the philosophic gravity of his countenance and the keen lightning of his eye. Mr. Cappell, on the contrary, resided as an apprentice in the same house where Lambert's office was, and saw Chatterton daily. His advances had been repelled at times with the flashing glances of the poet, and the terms in which he speaks of his pride and visible contempt for others show there was little friendship between them. But he also remarks, upon his being irritated or otherwise greatly affected, there was a light in his eyes which seemed very remarkable. He had frequently heard this referred to by others, and Mr. George Catcott speaks of it as one who had often quailed before such glances, or been spellbound, like Coleridge's wedding guest, by the glittering eye of the ancient mariner. He said he could never look at it long enough to see what sort of an eye it was, but it seemed to be a kind of hawk's eye. You could see his soul through it. From Gregory's Life of Chatterton The person of Chatterton, like his genius, was premature. He had a manliness and dignity beyond his years, and there was a something about him uncommonly prepossessing. His more remarkable feature was his eyes, which, though grey, were commonly piercing. When he was warmed, in argument or otherwise, they sparked with fire, and one eye, it is said, was still more remarkable than the other. End of section 20
Section twenty one of Word Portraits of Famous Writers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. Word Portraits of Famous Writers. Edited by Mabel E. Wotton. Geoffrey Chaucer. About thirteen forty to fourteen hundred from nicholas's life of chaucer asterisk the affection of ockliffe his contemporary and dear friend has made chaucer's person better known than that of any individual of his age the portrait of which an engraving illustrates this memoir is taken from ockliffe's painting already mentioned in the harleian manuscript four eight six six which he says was painted from memory after chaucer's decease and which is apparently the only genuine portrait in existence the figure which is half length has a background of green tapestry he is represented with grey hair and beard which is bifurked he wears a dark coloured dress and hood his right hand is extended and in his left he holds a string of beads from his vest a black case is suspended which appears to contain a knife or possibly a penner or pen case the expression of the countenance is intelligent but the fire of the eye seems quenched and evident marks of advanced age appear on the countenance this is incomparably the best portrait of chaucer yet discovered from nicholas's life of chaucer asterisk there is a third portrait in a copy of the canterbury tales made about the reign of king henry v being within twenty years of the poet's death in the Lansdowne manuscript eight fifty one the figure which is a small full length is placed in the initial letter of the volume he is dressed in a long grey gown with red stockings and black shoes fastened with black sandals round the ankles his head is bare and the hair closely cut in his right hand he holds an open book and a knife or pen case as in the other portraits is attached to his vest tradition asserts that chaucer merged his own personality in that of the poet in his canterbury tales from the prologue to the rhyme of sir topas o hoste to japon he begun and then at erst he locked upon me and sighed thus what man art thou quod he thou lookest as thou woldest find an hare for ever upon the ground i see thee star approach an ere, and look up merrily now where are you sirus and let this man have place he in the waist is sharpen as well as i this were a puppet in an armour to embrace for any woman small and fair of face he seemeth elvish by his countenance for unto no wicht doth he dalliance end of section twenty one Section 22 of Word Portraits of Famous Writers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adele Pooley. Word Portraits of Famous Writers. Edited by Mabel E. Watton. Philip Lord Chesterfield. 1694 to 1773 from life and letters of lord chesterfield philip dormer stanhope earl of chesterfield was a slight made man of the middle size rather genteel than handsome either in face or person but there was a certain suavity in his countenance which accompanied with a polite address and pleasing elocution obtained him in a wonderful degree the admiration of both sexes and made his suit irresistible with either he was naturally possessed of a fine sensibility but by a habit of mastering his passions and disguising his feelings he at length arrived at the appearance of the most perfect stoicism nothing surprised alarmed or discomposed him from haywards lord chesterfield Asterisk. the name of chesterfield has become a synonym for good breeding and politeness 
it is associated in our minds with all that is graceful in manner and cold in heart, attractive in appearance and unamiable in reality. The image it calls up is that of a man rather below the middle height in a court suit and blue riband, with regular features wearing an habitual expression of gentlemanlike ease. His address is insinuating, his bow perfect. His compliments rival those of Le Grand Monarque in delicacy. Laughter is too demonstrative for him, but the smile of courtesy is ever on his lips, and by the time he has gone through the circle, the great object of his daily ambition is accomplished. All the women are already half in love with him, and every man is desirous to be his friend. From Blackwood's Magazine, 1868 Lord Hervey pauses in his story of Queen Caroline and her court to describe with cutting and bitter force the character and appearance of his rival courtier. His person was as disagreeable as it was possible for a human figure to be without being deformed, he says. He was very short, disproportioned, thick and clumsily made, with black teeth and a head big enough for a polyphemus. One Ben Ashurst, who said few good things, though admired for many, told Lord Chesterfield once that he was like a stunted giant, which was a humorous idea and really apposite. The defects of his personal appearance are evidently exaggerated in this truculent sketch, but his portrait by Gainsborough, which is said to be the best, affords some foundation for the picture. The face is heavy, rugged and unlovely, though full of force and intelligence, and his unheroic form and stature are points which Chesterfield himself does not attempt to conceal. End of section 22「Section 23 of Word Portraits of Famous Writers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Word Portraits of Famous Writers. Edited by Mabel E. Watton. William Cobbett, 1762-1835. From Bamford's Passages in the Life of a Radical. Had I met him anywhere else, save in the room, and on that occasion, I should have taken him for a gentleman farming his own broad estate. He seemed to have that kind of self possession and ease about him, together with a certain bantering jollity which are so natural to fast handed and well housed lords of the soil. He was, I should suppose, not less than six feet in height, portly, with a fresh, clear and round cheek, and a small grey eye, twinkling with good-humoured archness. He was dressed in a blue coat, yellow swansdown waistcoat, drab kerseymere small clothes, and top boots. His hair was grey, and his cravat and linen fine, and very white. 1818. From Hazlitt's Table Talk. Mr. Cobbett speaks almost as well as he writes. The only time I ever saw him, he seemed to me a very pleasant man, easy of access, affable, clear headed, simple and mild in his manner, deliberate and unruffled in his speech, though some of his expressions were not very qualified his figure is tall and portly he has a good sensible face rather full with little grey eyes a hard square forehead a ruddy complexion with hair grey or powdered and had on a scarlet broadcloth waistcoat with the flaps of the pockets hanging down as was the custom for gentlemen farmers in the last century or as we see it in pictures of members of parliament in the reign of george the first i certainly did not think less favourably of him for seeing him from watson's biographies of wilkes and cobbett 
in stature the late mr cobbett was tall and athletic i should think he could not have been less than six feet two while his breadth was proportionately great he was indeed one of the stoutest men in the house his hair was of a milk-white colour and his complexion ruddy his features were not strongly marked what struck you most about his face was his small sparkling laughing eyes when disposed to be humorous yourself you had only to look at his eyes and you were sure to sympathise with his merriment when not speaking the expression of his eye and his countenance was very different he was one of the most striking refutations of the principles of lavater i ever witnessed never were the looks of any man more completely at variance with his character there was something so heavy and dull about his whole appearance that any one who did not know him would at once set him down for some country clodpole to use a favourite expression of his own who not only had never read a book or had a single idea in his head but who was a mere mass of mortality without a particle of sensibility of any kind in his composition he usually sat with one leg over the other his head slightly drooping as if sleeping on his breast and his hat down almost to his eyes his usual dress was a light grey coat of a full make a white waistcoat and kerseymere breeches of a sandy colour when he walked about the house he generally had his hands inserted in his breeches pocket considering his advanced age seventy-three he looked remarkably hale and healthy and walked with a firm but slow step eighteen thirty five end of section twenty three section twenty four of word portraits of famous writers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adele Pooley. Word Portraits of Famous Writers, edited by Mabel E. Watton. Hartley Coleridge, 1796-1849. to From Derwent Coleridge's Memoir of Hartley Coleridge. I first saw Hartley in the beginning, I think, of 1837, when I was at Sedberg, and he heard us on our lesson in Mr. Green's parlour. My impression of him was what I conceived Shakespeare's idea of a gentleman to be, something which we like to have in a picture. He was dressed in black, his hair, just touched with grey, fell in thick waves down his back, and he had a frilled shirt on, and there was a sort of autumnal ripeness and brightness about him. His shrill voice and his quick authoritative right, right, and the chuckle with which he translated rebrum repetundarum as peculation, a very common vice in governors of all ages, after which he took a turn around the sofa, all struck me amazingly. 1837. From Derwent Coleridge's Memoir of Hartley Coleridge. His manners and appearance were peculiar though not dwarfish either in form or expression, his stature was remarkably low, scarcely exceeding five feet, and he early acquired the gait and general appearance of advanced age. His once dark, lustrous hair was prematurely silvered, and became latterly quite white. His eyes, dark, soft and brilliant, were remarkably responsive to the movements of his mind, flashing with light from within. His complexion, originally clear and sanguine, looked weather-beaten, and the contour of his face was rendered less pleasing by the breadth of his nose. His head was very small, the ear delicately formed, and the forehead, which receded slightly, very wide and expansive. His hands and feet were also small and delicate. His countenance, when in repose, or rather in stillness, was stern and thoughtful in the extreme 
indicating deep and passionate meditation, so much so as to be at times almost startling. His low bow on entering a room in which there were ladies or strangers gave a formal to his address, which wore at first the appearance of constraint, but when he began to talk these impressions were presently changed. He threw off the seeming weight of years, his countenance became genial, and his manner free and gracious. 1843 From Little's Living Age, 1849 His head was large and expressive, with dark eyes and white waving locks, and resting upon broad shoulders with the smallest possible apology for a neck. To a sturdy and ample frame were appended legs and arms of a most disproportioned shortness, and, in his wholesome aspect, there was something indescribably elfish and grotesque such as limners do not love to paint, nor ladies to look upon. He reminded you of a spyglass shut up, and you wanted to take hold of him and pull him out into a man of goodly proportions and average stature. It was difficult to repress a smile at his appearance as he approached, for the elements were so quaintly combined in him that he seemed like one of Cowley's conceits translated into flesh and blood. His manners were like those of men accustomed to live much alone, simple, frank, and direct, but not in all respects governed by the rules of conventional politeness. It was difficult for him to sit still. He was constantly leaving his chair, walking about the room, and then sitting down again, as if he were haunted by an incurable restlessness. His conversation was very interesting, and marked by a vein of quiet humour not found in his writings. He spoke with much deliberation and in regularly constructed periods which might have been printed without any alteration. There was a peculiarity in his voice not easily described. He would begin a sentence in a sort of subdued tone, hardly above a whisper, and end it in something between a bark and a growl. 1848 End of section 24《ポートレット・ザ・フェイマス・ライターズ》この放送は、ライターズ・ザ・フェイマス・ライターズ。この放送は、ライターズ・ザ・フェイマス・ライターズ。この放送は、ライターズ・ザ・フェイマス・ライターズ。この放送は、ライターズ・ザ・フェイマス・ライターズ。この放送は、ライターズ・ザ・フェイマス・ライターズ。この放送は、ライターズ・ザ・フェイマス・ライターズ。この放送は、ライターズ・ザ・フェイマス・ライターズ。この放送は、ライターズ・ザ・フェイマス・ライターズ。この放送は、ライターズ・ザ・フェイマス・ライターズ。この放送は、ライターズ・ザ・フェイマス・ライターズ。I had received directions for finding out the house where Coolridge was visiting, and in riding down a main street of Bridgewater I noticed a gateway corresponding to the description given me. Under this was standing and gazing about him a man whom I shall describe. In height he might seem to be about five feet eight. He was in reality about an inch and a half taller, but his figure was of an order which drowns the height. His person was broad and full, and tended even to corpulence. His complexion was fair though not what painters technically style fair, because it was associated with black hair, his eyes were large and soft in their expression, and it was from the peculiar haze or dreaminess which mixed with their light that I recognized my object. This was Coolridge. 1807. From Brian Proctor's Recollection of Men of Letters. Coolridge had a weighty head, dreaming gray eyes, full sensual lips, and a look and manner which were entirely wanting in firmness and decision. His motions also appeared weak and undecided, and his voice had nothing of the sharpness or ring of a resolute man. When he spoke his words were thick and slow, and when he read poetry his utterance was altogether a chant. About 1820. From Froude's Life of Carlyle I have seen many curiosities, not the least of them I reckon Coolidge, the Kantian metaphysician and quondam lake poet. I will tell you all about our interview when we meet. Figure a fat, flabby, incurvated personage, at once short, rotund, and relaxed, with a watery mouth, a snuffy nose, a pair of strange, brown, timid, yet earnest-looking eyes, a high, tapering brow, and a great bush of gray hair, and you have some faint idea of Coolidge. He is a kind, good soul, full of religion and affection and poetry and animal magnetism. His cardinal sin is that he wants will. He has no resolution. 
he shrinks from pain or labor in any of its shapes his very attitude bespeaks this he never straightens his knee joints he stoops with his fat ill-shapen shoulders and in walking he does not tread but shovel and slide my father would call it scluffing he is always busied to keep by strong and frequent inhalations the water of his mouth from overflowing and his eyes have a look of anxious impotence he would do with all his heart but he knows he dares not the conversation of the man is much as i anticipated a forest of thoughts some true many false more part dubious all of them ingenious in some degree often in a high degree but there is no method in his talk he wanders like a man sailing among many currents whithersoever his lazy mind directs him and what is more unpleasant he preaches or rather soliloquizes he cannot speak he can only talk so he names it hence i found him unprofitable even tedious but we parted very good friends i promising to go back and see him some evening a promise which i fully intend to keep i sent him a copy of meister about which we had some friendly talk i reckon him a man of great and useless genius a strange not at all a great man eighteen twenty four end of section twenty five Section 26 of Word Portraits of Famous Writers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Schempf. Word Portraits of Famous Writers. Edited by Mabel E. Watton. William Collins, 1720 to 1756 from gentleman's magazine 1781 collins i was intimately acquainted with from the time that he came to reside at oxford in london i met him often he was of moderate stature of a light and clear complexion with grey eyes so very weak at times as hardly to bear a candle in the room and often raising within him apprehensions of blindness he was passionately fond of music good-natured and affable warm in his friendships and visionary in his pursuits and as long as i knew him temperate in his eating and drinking from johnson's life of collins about this time i fell into his company his appearance was decent and manly his knowledge considerable his views extensive his conversation elegant and his disposition cheerful seventeen forty four from J. Langhorne's Memoirs of William Collins. Mr. Collins was, in stature, somewhat above the middle size, of a brown complexion, keen expressive eyes, and a fixed sedate aspect, which from intense thinking had contracted an habitual frown. His proficiency in letters was greater than could have been expected from his years. He was skilled in the learned languages and acquainted with the Italian, French, and Spanish. End of section 26. Section 27 of Word Portraits of Famous Writers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo. Word Portraits of Famous Writers, edited by Mabel E. Watton. William Cowper, 1731-1800 to From Cowper's Letters As for me, I am a very smart youth of my years. I am not indeed grown gray so much as I am grown bald. No matter. There was more hair in the world than ever had the honor to belong to me. Accordingly, having found just enough to curl a little at my ears and to intermingle with a little of my own that still hangs behind i appear if you see me in an afternoon to have a very decent headdress not easily distinguished from my natural growth which being worn with a small bag and a black ribbon about my neck continues to me the charms of my youth even on the verge of age away with the fear of writing too often yours my dearest cousin, W.C. P.S. 
that the view i give you of myself may be complete i add the two following items that i am in debt to nobody and that i grow fat seventeen eighty five from h f carey's notice of cowper cowper was of a middle height with limbs strongly framed hair of light brown eyes of a bluish gray and ruddy complexion from rossetti's memoir of cowper asterisk the eager sudden-looking large-eyed shaven face of cowper is familiar to us in his portraits a face sharp-cut and sufficiently well moulded without being handsome nor particularly sympathetic it is a high-strung excitable face as of a man too susceptible and touchy to put himself forward willingly among his fellows but who feeling a vocation upon him would be more than merely earnest self-asserting aggressive and unyielding this is in fact very much the character of his writings end of section twenty seven section twenty eight of word portraits of famous writers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by phil schempf word portraits of famous writers edited by mabel e watton george crabb seventeen fifty four to eighteen thirty two from life of crab by his son in the eye of memory i can still see him as he was at that period of his life his fatherly countenance unmixed with any of the less lovable expressions that in too many faces obscure that character but preeminently fatherly conveying the ideas of kindness intellect and purity his manner grave manly and cheerful in unison with his high and open forehead his very attitudes whether as he sat absorbed in the arrangement of his minerals shells and insects or as he laboured in his garden until his naturally pale complexion acquired a tinge of fresh healthy red or as coming lightly toward us with some unexpected present his smile of indescribable benevolence spoke exultation in the foretaste of our raptures seventeen eighty nine from life of crab by his son mr lockhart recently favoured me with the following letter his noble forehead his bright beaming eye without anything of old age about it though he was then i presume above seventy his sweet and i would say innocent smile and the calm mellow tones of his voice are all reproduced the moment i open any page of his poetry eighteen twenty two from s c hall's memories of great men in the appearance of crab there was little of the poet but even less of the stern critic of mankind who looked at nature askance and ever contemplated beauty animate or inanimate the simple loves and simple joys through a glass darkly on the contrary he seemed to my eyes the representative of the class of rarely troubled and seldom thinking english farmers a clear gray eye a ruddy complexion as if he loved exercise and wooed mountain breezes were the leading characteristics of his countenance it is a picture of age frosty but kindly that of a tall and stalwart man gradually grown old to whom age was rather an ornament than a blemish he was one of those instances of men plain perhaps in youth and homely of countenance in manhood who become absolutely handsome when white hairs have become a crown of glory and indulgence in excesses or perilous passions has left no lines that speak of remorse or even of airs unatoned eighteen twenty five to twenty six end of section twenty eight section twenty nine of word portraits of famous writers this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Fascio. Word Portraits of Famous Writers. Edited by Mabel E. Watton. 
Daniel Defoe, 1661 to 1731. From Secretary of State's Proclamation. Whereas Daniel Defoe, alias Defoe, is charged with writing a scandalous and seditious pamphlet titled The Shortest Way with the Centers. He is a middle-sized spare man, about forty years old, of a brown complexion, and dark brown-colored hair, but wears a wig, a hook nose, a sharp chin, gray eyes, and a large mole near his mouth. 1703. From Wilson's Defoe, Asterix. A likeness of the author, engraved by Monsieur Vandergucht, from a painting by Taverner, is prefixed to a volume of treatises published in 1703. It is the first portrait of Defoe, and probably the most like him. The following description of it by a recent biographer is strikingly characteristic. No portrait can have more verisimilitude, to say the least of it. It exhibits a set of features rather regular than otherwise, very determined in its outlines, very particularly in the mouth, which expresses great firmness and resolution of character. The eyes are full, black, and grave-looking, but the impression of the whole countenance is rather a striking than a pleasing one. Daniel is here set forth in a most lordly and full-bottom wig, which flows down lower than his elbow, and rises above his forehead with great amplitude of curl. A richly laced cravat, and fine loose flowing cloak completes his attire, and preserve, we may suppose, the likeness of that civil gallantry which old Mixon describes to Daniel on the occasion of his escorting King William to the Lord Mayor's feast. It is altogether more like a picture of a substantial citizen of the surly breed Defoe has himself so often satirized, than that of a poor pamphleteer languishing in jail after the tears of the pillory. From John Forster's Biographical Essays it is to us very pleasing to contemplate the meeting of such a sovereign and such a subject, as William and Defoe. There was something not dissimilar in their physical aspect, as in their moral temperament resemblances undoubtedly existed. The king was the elder by ten years, but the middle size, the spare figure, the hooked nose, the sharp chin, the keen gray eye, the large forehead, and grave appearance were common to both. William's manner was cold, except in battle, and little warmth was ascribed to Defoe's, unless he spoke of civil liberty. End of section 29